Thank you for returning again. My guest today is John Thomas. He is past president, media spokesperson, and board member of the North Texas Skeptics. I should join. You should join, or we should all get your newsletter, which, <laughs> which, which I found very interesting. You know, you talk about various issues, things that you've looked into, and the fact that a lot of them don't have any um, scientific basis. Um, anyone can be a psychic if you study the technique is what you say. For instance, how could I sit down and learn to use a crystal ball or tarot cards? Okay, it's very simple. You have to realize that the crystal ball, the tarot card, the planets in astrology, the lines in your palms, these are all just props. All fortune telling systems have some kind of a randomizing agent like this which just produces a random result like the line in the palm or the position of the planets when you were born. This then is used by the fortune teller or the uh, psychic to look up in some table or book of lore to get the predictions. These predictions or advice are simply made up by whoever wrote that book. So you're using, what you're really getting is randomness. And the next step is really the most interesting part of fortune telling. It's called cold reading and this is how the fortune teller or the psychic uses these props and this lore from the book to convince you that they know all about you. Do it to me. I'm not an expert at it, but I can tell you how it's done. <laughs> okay. Uh, stage magicians do this all the time. Like all right, Bob's here's talent. my palm. Okay, for example, I might look at your lifeline here, and I would see that there's a broken lifeline, and then I would look and knowing my lore from my book of palmistry, I would have a stock spiel to talk about what that means. I would say, for example, well, that means that uh, you're probably going to have a long life, but you may have a divorce along the way, <clears throat> and you may lose one of your children or whatever. And while I'm giving you this story... Do I really have a broken <laughs> line? No, I don't know. I'm oh, not a oh, palmist. okay, good. <clears throat> but you can see how easy you can make They've up a fortune-telling system. They've all told me I'm going to have a long life. Well, it's, it's not good for customer relations to tell people that they're going to die soon. Most advice is, tends to be positive. But the next step is there's a general spiel. This is a, the basic premise of fortune-telling. You start out, you're a, you're an, I can see that you're an intelligent person, although sometimes you may feel like you've made the wrong decision you know, back and forth. You, uh, you're a generous person, but you tend to be tight with your money. And you look for reactions in the client. You look at their body language. What are their eyes doing? Are they interested or are they getting bored? Uh, did they suddenly stiffen up when you mentioned divorce or did, were they completely relaxed? A good psychic will look for these body language signs and follow up and go down that path. So in other words, if I stiffened up when they said divorce, they might see that, well, she probably has a good marriage and has no idea. So what you would say then is, but if you work very hard in the next few weeks, mm -hmm. because then you'll figure if you say something positive, they probably weren't going to get divorced anyway, and then they'll feel like because of her advice, they kept the marriage together. Mm -hmm. I might See what make, I'm saying? Sure. But if I just kind of sat there when she said divorce and went, oh, then there's a good possibility I was heading in that direction anyway. It didn't surprise me. She said so. Well, one thing psychics do, and this is why not everybody is good at that, although anybody can learn the technique, is that psychics tend to be people who are interested in other people. They like to observe other people. They pay attention more than a lot of us do to other people and their wants and their needs. And they peg a client's psychological profile. Is this, uh, you look at the age, the demeanor, the dress the person is wearing, what kind of educational background they have. You usually get that from them. They'll talk to you. They'll tell you all about, you, about themselves. But, well, so your advice would be, when, if you're going to do this, keep a totally straight face. Don't react to anything and, just, and don't give them any information. See what they give you and then see how accurate it was. Well, that would be a scientific test, but it wouldn't be much fun, I guess, for a psychic reading because you really wouldn't get a very good reading from that. The psychic would be left with guesswork. And a good guess is always good to try if you're going to be a psychic. If you make a guess and you hit it right on the nose, you have made a strong impression on that person, and you can quickly exploit that. Basically, this kind of thing is a control technique. It's a way for that person to get control over you and get them to believe that you know all about them. If you're only paying $5 for a psychic reason, uh, reading, all you've lost is $5. But I think it can get a little more serious when people start to turn over control of their lives to somebody who is really psychologically manipulating them, whether they realize it or not. And that is a scary thing when they tell you to avoid planes or to avoid, you know, this travel at this certain thing. And then people really do cancel their vacation plans or their sure. traveling plans. Well, it's, it's because very... Because this person has a feeling. Uh, they wanted me to ask you about no, uh, Nostradamus. Nostradamus? Nostradamus was a uh, 16th century uh, Frenchman who wrote a book of predictions back then in uh, very bad ungrammatical French that had been translated numerous mm -hmm. times down through the centuries and claimed to have great predictive power. 
problem with it, it's a classic example of vagueness. There are no specific events mentioned in Nostradamus. He talks about opposing sides in war, for example, as the Greens and the Reds. A city might be the Great Lady. Is it Paris or is it London? Uh, you know, he talks about universal events, wars, famines, insurrections, burning of cities, things that, you know, at least in those days, certainly happened all the time. The point is you can read into it anything you want to. If you look at different translations of Nostradamus down through the years, say up to 1940, you'll find that the translator says it's amazing. Everything he predicted up to 1940 came true. And then you look for the predictions for the future and somehow they don't work out. Then a guy writes a book in 1960 and suddenly all those predictions came true up in 1960 because he's interpreting it to fit the facts. Well, so I guess one could make the same argument, however, about the Bible because the things that it predicts uh, have come true. Well, a lot of people read the Bible like it was the book of fortune telling. You know, we're not concerned with religious beliefs in the North Texas skeptics. We're just concerned with science issues. And uh, I guess people are entitled to read the Bible that way if they want to, but uh, they might want to think that they're doing the same thing that people do uh, who interpret Nostradamus or other very vague writings. Speaking of that, as skeptics, you also feel that the science of creationism is, is a pseudoscience. And yes. many would beg <clears throat> to disagree with you there. Mm -hmm. Well, that's an interesting and hot topical uh, issue right now. Creationism is the belief that there's scientific evidence that the Earth is only about 6,000 years old and all the plants and animals were created at one time and that evolution did not take place. Notice that I'm not saying that people who believe that as a matter of faith are pseudoscientists. It's the people who claim their scientific evidence that that's so that we're concerned about. It is a pseudoscience. Uh, it, it is not based on fact that creationists do not check their evidence and they don't do scientific research to find out if they're correct or not. It would be interesting. I'd like to see you there with a, a debate uh, with, um, I'm trying to remember some of the people's names, uh, uh, the Plexi River or something. I think there's some fossils there. Or yes, one of our, the man track controversy. One of our yeah. members, Ron Hastings, a science teacher in Waxahachie, is a nationally known expert. Ron Hastings, on, on that's the, who uh, I'm thinking of. Yeah, he's a nationally known expert on the Plexi man track issues and the claims by the creationists that these tracks were made in the same, at the same time the dinosaurs walked the earth. We, that sh that's a topic for a whole nother that's show. An, we should do that. Show. Um, real quickly, these crystals. I see so many people with these mm -hmm. necklaces and crystals hanging around them. And, and uh, one of my friends who wears these is probably one of the illest people I know right now. Well, crystals are beautiful. Uh, we know <laughs> physics knows a lot about how crystals are beautiful. Uh, you know, we know a lot about the physics of how they're formed and, and what they are. Uh, there's no evidence at all that they have any special healing power or any energy. It's just a misuse of scientific terms like energy and vibration, which is often done in pseudoscientific fields to misuse a term, say from physics or chemistry, and make it mean anything in the world that you want to mean. Well, why is it, why is it that it seems that the people who are most into this are celebrities? Well, I have a theory about that, which might be unfair. I don't know. I, I think that people who are celebrities and are good actors tend to be fantasy-prone personalities who have more difficulty than most of us do about separating reality from fantasy. Uh, psychologists estimate that about 4% of the population falls in that category of fantasy-prone personalities. These people aren't crazy at all. They're perfectly sane people. They just don't tend to make as much distinction as most of us do about checking their beliefs and uh, seeing what's real and what's not. They, they fantasize And they do vividly. live in an unreal world. Yeah, and, and people in the news, in, in, the, uh, in the media and in um, uh, movies, for example, I, I think are especially attracted to these things. You have said in your literature, um, if the schools schools take a, in a lot of this information and the kids learn about them, mm -hmm. uh, treat all claims as equally valid and worthy of belief, then they will turn out people who are commercially, politically, and intellectually easily, um, easy to mold and manipulate. You feel like we're turning out ignorant kids about some of this stuff. I think we've got a real problem in this country about science education and education and thinking skills. And to me, this is the main thrust of the whole uh, organization is education. In, in how to think straight, how to test ideas, and how to test claims. There seems to be ideas going around this country that it's just not nice to challenge anybody's beliefs. It's just, if you don't agree with them, you just have to keep quiet because what's true for me is true for me, and what's true for you is true for you, and so forth and so on. So if, if we could edu educate our kids to be able to see beyond the obvious mm -hmm. and actually test 
ideas to see if they were true or not, we could keep a lot of kids out of the cults that they get into today. We have to take another break. When we come back, they have a newsletter. Again, they have speakers who can come to your organizations. They have monthly lecture series and a database that can help you uh, find the answer to some of your questions about um, the paranormal. Stay with us. Mm -hmm.